My name is Patrick McGinnis, and I'm the guy who invented the term FOMO. That's short for fear of missing out. Today, FOMO is an epidemic, and it's changing us so much that it sort of feels like we're evolving into a new species. But FOMO doesn't have to take over your life. You can find the power to choose what you actually want and the courage to miss out on the rest. I'll show you how right here on FOMO Sapiens. FOMO. FOMO. Welcome to FOMO Sapiens, the show about finding the power to choose what you actually want in business and life and the courage to miss out on the rest. I'm your host, Patrick McGinnis, the creator of FOMO, and I'm coming at you live from Advertising Week in New York City. And that's the noise you hear in the background is the buzz of the crowd. In 2018, Princeton Review released its Hopes and Worries survey report and found that 99% of students and parents report stress when it comes to applying to college. In fact, 74% of students and 69% of parents reported high stress levels. I mean, this is kind of unbelievable, but if you have ever applied to college, you know that it can be a very stressful time. And you also know that college prep is a billion dollar business where the stakes are very high. I want to talk about this because for me, as I think about people applying to college every year, that summons ideas of FOMO, fear of missing out, and also FOBO, fear of a better option. As you try to apply at all kinds of schools, then you try to choose which one is actually best for you. And I have the perfect person to talk with that about, uh, about uh, with me today. Kate Everly Walker is an education CEO, investor, advisor, and she was the CEO of the Princeton Review, a leading provider of testing, tutoring and emissions services. Uh, she stayed with the company through its 2017 sale to ST Unitas. Prior to working at Princeton Review, Kate spent nine years at Kaplan, where she managed M&A and investments, including the creation of the Kaplan Techstars EdTech Accelerator. She holds a bachelor's degree from Georgetown University, an MBA from Harvard Business School, and lives here in New York City with her husband and two daughters. Welcome, Kate. Thank you, Patrick. So, I, first of all, you know, for, for people who may not know us, I've known you since the 90s, is that right? Oh, that's a long time. Know, it's, it's a long true. time. It's we true. went to undergrad and grad school together. Yep. Um, Can't get away from you. I know. So basically, this is like hanging out at my house or your house mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But I want to start with a very important, impressive question that I like to ask everybody before we get going, which is, what is giving you FOMO right now? Oh, I'm experiencing a lot of FOMO on behalf of my children lately. Child related FOMO, I love it. They, you know, they're, they're so scheduled and there's always more than one thing to do after school every day and should marry and if she does rock climbing, she can't do trumpet lessons and then will she miss out on playing music with her friends? It's very, very hard and they don't feel enough of it so I feel it for them. Well, you know, since you brought up your daughters, you know, one thing I love about your daughters is they speak French fluently. Beautifully. Which as, as somebody who's studying the better language than, better than me. makes yeah. me have French FOMO, oh. le FOMO français, I guess you'd say. Le FOMO. Le FOMO, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so at some point or another, um, you're going to have a situation where you're going to, oh, look at this, fixing my mic. OK, much better. Um, this is the beauty of a live show, is that you get to see the bloopers. Um, at some point or another, your kids are going to apply to college, but I wanted to start with your experience is applying to college, and I'm going to pipe in with mine, but you know, t take me back to the days of Nirvana and grunge and... Yes. And, um, I, I, I did wear Doc Martens Fugazi, back then. Yep, all sure. these people, and applying to college. What was it like? How many schools did you apply to? How stressful was it? You know, what was it like back then? So I would say my experience was pretty chill by today's standards. I went to a public high school. I spent an hour, everybody got a one hour appointment with their guidance counselor where okay. you talked about what you thought you might want to study, what you might like about a college. I said, I thought I was interested in business and I wanted to go to school in, in a city. Okay. And based on that, she thought about it and said, you know, I think Georgetown would be good for you. You should apply there. You should apply there early. And I said, okay, cool. And then she said, and you know, you should, you should throw in a few Ivy Leagues too because you've got good grades and good scores and you never know. So I applied to Georgetown early, and then I did do a few other applications. I applied to a total of four schools, and um, I did my Georgetown interview, early action, so it was really the only thing I had going, and I thought it was gonna be easy and smooth sailing, and then um, I did the interview with an alumni, and about a week later, turned out that alumni was friends with my 
amazing AP Chemistry High School teacher, Mrs. Voorhees, Mrs. Voorhees pulls me aside and said, you know, my friend interviewed you and she was very disappointed that you wore jeans to your interview. Wow. And she thought that was very inappropriate and based on that, she couldn't give you a wholehearted recommendation. So wow. then I was in crisis and panic and I didn't know what I was gonna do if Off. I didn't get in. Fortunately, I got in anyway and vowed to both become an alumni interview myself one day and not judge people by what You're they were. You're not wearing today, are you? And I <laughs> also vowed to always be overdressed, not underdressed in the future. And it all worked out and I went to Georgetown and I, it did turn out that I loved it. Um, I can't say that I, you know, did a lot of research or put a lot of thought into it. And I, did it, you take an SAT prep course? I didn't take an SAT prep course. Okay. Um, I bought a book which can be incredibly effective yes. if you have you know, personal willpower and discipline and want to do it yourself. And then I got a little bit of tutoring from my high school math teacher. So I actually thought when I took the SAT that studying beforehand was cheating because it was meant to really see your aptitude and so you should not oh, prepare. You wanted it to be pure. <laughs> yes. Oh, Patrick. I know. <laughs> and so- Is that what you did? Yeah, oh. I did. And I took it, and I did fine. I mean, it was great. But and I remember I applied to call. I applied to eight colleges. I applied to three early: mm -hmm. University of Maine, Boston College, and Georgetown. I got into them, thankfully. But then, because of I wanted to have good financial aid, we applied. My parents, you know, and I did research, and we applied to schools that gave great financial aid, so that we could maybe have a bargaining chip. Because I really wanted to go to Georgetown, yeah. and thankfully, actually, Georgetown beat everybody. So love you, Georgetown University. Oh, cool. Um, but I remember, you know, we visited all the colleges, but like it wasn't like. You know, it was stressful a little bit, but it wasn't it wasn't something that necessarily was that terrible. Yet right. today, uh, take tell, take me about through kind of the typical college application experience today. Okay, today it's much more stressful, I think. Part of the reason is that, you know, you read a lot out there, there's headlines every year around admissions time saying more people than ever are applying to college. Okay. Um, that's not actually true. The population, the, the birth rate is going down. The actual number of high school graduates every year applying to college is actually pretty flat. You now see about two thirds of high school graduates will apply to and look to go directly to four year college. And with the total number of those high school seniors coming down a little bit, it's, you know, it's sort of evening out to about the same. But okay. what is happening is where you applied to seven or eight schools, I applied to four. Today, t the, t the average is eight, and the typical competitive student applying to elite colleges is gonna apply to 15 schools. Wow, so you, a lot of applications. So you have a lot of, a lot of application Whoa. fees and a lot of applications. Yeah. So the, the actual correct stat is that there are many more applications submitted to college today That's FOMO right than there. ever before. That's total FOMO. It's total FOMO, it's total FOMO. It's about, you know, I don't know if I'm gonna get in, it's really hard to get in, so I better increase my chances by applying to as many schools as I possibly can. And then talk about test prep. How much are people spending on test prep? Well, that's all over the map. A lot of people don't prep. Okay, um, just like me. Just like the you. The purists. Just like you. Uh, but most most people do. Now, there's really, really good free test prep these days, which did not exist in the same way when we were applying, but there's also much more expensive prep available these days than ever before. So if, if money is no object and you're looking to refine a top score into something a little better to be that distinguishing factor on your application, you might spend Five thousand, ten thousand, twenty thousand wow. dollars on a private tutor. So people, people can and do spend a lot of money on this. I would say the average is to spend about a thousand dollars. Okay. And then, what about the actual application of itself? I, I so I sometimes I, I work out of the Harvard Club here in New York City, and I see these people who are very clearly helping yes. high school students to get into colleges because they're basically. It's really interesting to hear these conversations and they're sort of asking them about what they want to do and you can tell that they're, these are kids who come from means. Sometimes their parents show up and I'm wondering like, how much are these people charging these students? What's the deal there? So that, that's sort of a new career that has emerged in the past 10, 15 years where you know, smart, smart, accomplished people who went to great schools and wanted flexible work, I would say 10, 15 years ago, would be private tutors. You know, yeah. They might become a math tutor. Now you might become a college counselor or a college essay reviewer or an admissions advisor. And um, you, you might charge 
$100 an hour, if you're, the, those people that you're overhearing in the Harvard Club are probably charging $400, $500 an hour. Wow. That's, yeah. I clearly made yeah. the wrong line of business. Yeah. But the thing is, it's, you know, why, if you have the money to spend, why not spend it? This is an incredibly important moment in your child's life. It's, you know, where, where someone goes to college is going to determine everything from that point on, right? It's, it's a significant life event. So I think that, you know, that's part of why people can and do get carried away. Because if you're not going to, you're not going to spend on this, what else is that important as determining where you go to school or where your child goes to school? And does this stuff actually work? Like, say you have a kid who is fine, you know, fine student, middle of the road, whatever, but mom and dad have tons of disposable income and you hire all these tutors and all these services and everything. Like, it does it, can you sort of polish an apple that way or, you know, as our friend Sarah, not my friend, but Sarah Palin said, put lipstick on a pig. Can you do that or, or, or is there a abandoned range in which somebody can actually affect that? I mean, yes, it works. The, the answer, of course, is to some extent, yes. it works. There are, you know, there, there's a business, there, there's a guy I read about who takes, um, he takes 20 students a year and he charges them $100,000 each with a guarantee that he'll get them into Harvard or whatever the school of their choice is. And if they don't, if they don't get in, he'll refund the money. And he's betting that wow. you know, across the it's 20 like kids at 100,000, he'll, he'll make enough money. Wow. Um, so some people actually guarantee, now they guarantee results. Of course, they're not delivering 100% success rate. You can't control ultimately what the admissions officers decide to do and what they're looking for in the class. But where where it helps a lot to get personal advice, if you can afford it, is in test prep. It definitely works. To, you improve your scores the more, the more time you spend prepping and the more time you spend practicing. And where I think it's most valuable in the college counseling side is in helping you figure out where to apply, where you uniquely will fit and will be appealing to the school. Because each, each admissions team is looking for something different. And you know there might be 50 great schools out there that are all equally well credentialed. And a counselor will know more than you do as a student about which ones of those will want you. It's one thing that's always mystified me about higher education in the United States is the fact that there is, and I want you to push back on this if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. I, you know, tell me I'm wrong. There is no relationship between price and quality in American higher education. To go to an elite college and to go to a middle of the road college basically costs the same. Mm -hmm. Like think about that. When you buy a car, when you buy a house, when you buy a dinner, generally the more expensive it is, like theoretically the better it is. Obviously, you know, not always, but in general there's a there's a correlation that one can observe. Mm -hmm. Not true with higher education. Do you agree or that, that, that's a really interesting point. I do agree, except that it looks like it might be starting to change. A few schools in the past year have come out and announced that they're making significant cuts to their tuition. Schools that aren't as competitive, that are you know, maybe admitting 30% of their applicants instead of 4% of their applicants, are actually lowering tuition and you know, making a bet that, that there will, that you know, at a lower price, they'll appeal more and they'll fit in like the value band better than, than they do by just always raising tuition, always matching to the price of the highest provider. So that may change in the future as you know students, parents, customers of higher education become savvier about the price value equation. But historically, it was absolutely true. I mean, tuition was basically the same across all schools and essentially very, very, very high. Right, because there's an arms race. Mm -hmm. What I've observed, I mean, if you visit a college campus these days, it's sort of like, a, not every school, but most schools have, the dorms are less like the dorms that we think of as the traditional dorms, they're more like hotels. Yes. And the food, if you go to our alma mater, Georgetown, they have like a Mongolian barbecue, which is, I'm psyched, I think that's really, really? nice, but is it, Man. I think they do, yeah. Or Man, it's, why it's didn't we like, get that? Which is good, and I think, I, wanna, I don't wanna get too hot on this, because Malcolm Gladwell got yelled at for talking about food at Bowdoin and saying it was, kind of too outlandish. I think good food is great, but the reality is is if a school cost, you know, if there is a there are lots of things that are that are nice to have that aren't essential to an educational experience that push the cost in a direction that so many people are excluded. Right that you have to kind of ask yourself about what that equation looks like. Yeah, but part of the problem is that today there actually are other viable alternatives to going to a four-year college. You can study whatever you want to study online. You can go to you know, a specific 
coding boot camp and learn how to become an engineer without getting an undergraduate engineering degree. So as more of those alternatives come into the picture, I think what schools are betting on is that if they offer more amenities yeah. that make it appealing to still be in a place-based experience for four years, that that's how they'll continue to attract students. I mean, they're, they're sort of having to sell themselves in a way that they didn't previously, although that's that dynamic is still pretty skewed, considering that the most competitive schools admit less than 5% of their applicants. Yeah. They don't have to sell too hard yet, yeah. but, but more and more schools are gonna have to. So what about, you know, you were at the Princeton Review, mm -hmm. which I know a little bit about, but you know, for the benefit of everybody who's listening, what is Princeton Review about, and really what was, what is the core kind of offering, and how, I imagine there is a little bit of FOMO driving people to partake of the services, like what is that, what does that ex experience for the student look like, and how, why do they decide to go with, the, with that company? Yeah, so, so Princeton Review is offering test preparation and classes through tutors, through books, online. Uh, you know, a lot of it is for the SAT or the ACT, the two college admissions exams. And then Princeton Review also offers college counselors, so one-to-one -one advising and help in creating your list, researching your schools, creating your list, completing your applications, working through your essay topics, all of those pieces. So it's really the, you know, the entire spectrum of services you might need as you think about college, apply to college. Um, I think there is a lot of FOMO involved in it. You know, the way most parents make the decision, because it's really the parents deciding Especially to, the hel helicopter parents nowadays. Yeah, right? yeah, and it's not, you know, you don't typically see the 16-year-old high school student saying, you know, mom and dad, could you, could, you send, could you buy this course for me? Could you send me here? Sure. It's the parents researching it, wanting to do it, and signing their kids up. For the most part, when you survey those parents about what's driving them to purchase and how they're making their decision, by far the top, the top reason given is my friend or neighbor told me about it or recommended it to me. So this is very much one of these things where, you know, Jane's daughter got Joneses. into Stanford yeah. and what did you do? Oh, you used that. Well, then I need to get that for my daughter too. You know what? It's interesting when you bring this up, this was not a planned question, but as I'm listening to you, I think about equity and the fact that in a community where people have a lot of disposable income, it's really easy to buy these services and give those kids an advantage. You may have communities where people just don't have the cash to do this, or they don't have the exposure. How do we, what are the, um, I imagine people are thinking about this yes. problem. Yeah. Like what, where, where are people thinking about this? Do big companies, that provide these services for a fee? Do they offer accessible programs for people that may not be able to afford it? How's how does that yeah. work out? There's a few. There's a there's a lot of thought put into this. I'd say not only by the by the companies, but all of the teachers and tutors. I mean, it's it's rewarding to help privileged students, you know, maximize their choices and find find the right college. But it, you know, it does feel like you're not doing enough if you're only doing that for students that are starting out with an advantage. So, you know, we think about it a lot, we talk about it a lot. There's a couple of main ways that I think work best to do it. One, which Princeton Review did a lot of, is um, you offer these services not just on a consumer basis, but through schools, through public K-12 schools. There's a lot of funds out there from districts and schools for college admissions advice and college prep. And so schools can use their budgets to buy these services, to have teachers come in and give the same prep, the same tutoring, the same, you know, those same sorts of advantages to students in public schools who might not be able to purchase them on their own. So that's, that's a big way to do it. The other one that most high-end tutoring and advising companies that I know do is they have scholarship programs. You know, they, for, for ever, ever so many that they sell, they're gonna give one or two, or the, or the you know, prep schools, the elite boarding schools that they work with, they'll tell them, you know, any students that you have that you think could benefit from our services as well but can't afford it, let us know, we'll work with you, and we'll figure it out. There, there's a lot sort of given alongside 
the part that's sold to, I think, increase that access. Because it's a big, big issue. I mean, if you don't know what people are even doing, let alone have access to the advice yourself, you're not going to score as well on the tests. You're not going to know which schools to apply to necessarily. Like me, you're not going to know that you're not supposed to wear jeans to your right. interview. And that one thing could, you know, could crush your chances. And what about just, you know, on that same topic of equity, because uh, these days I think a lot of Americans are thinking about what, you know, what do we want our society to look like, right? Yeah. That the tests themselves, you know, I've read a lot about tests themselves are designed, that for some people it's just, it's harder for them to score as well because of the, the intrinsic questions that are asked. Is that, right. how, how is that being addressed? How do people think about that in the, in the, in the test prep part of it? Like where, where does that stand? That's, there, there's much more, testing of the tests today than okay. there was in the past. I'd say the, the SAT that you and I took had a lot more intrinsic bias built into it. That, that entire test was recreated several years ago and done you know, in an environment and in a way that those every question they were writing was tested thoroughly for any you know, intrinsic biases that it might have. So I'd say the tests are less biased today in how they're written. The, the, main, the main equity and bias issue is just in that these you always will perform better on these tests if you're prepared for them, if you've seen them before, if you're, if you're comfortable with the format, and you'll perform even better if you have someone who's an expert in that test privately tutoring you and telling you what you need to do and what you need to think about to get those extra 10, 20, 30 points. Gotcha. So it's really about, uh, about getting everyone to know that they need to prep and to have access to tools to prep with. And, okay, you got a student who does, they, they, they do all the things that you've talked about. They prep, they do well, they get into, they apply to their 27 schools or whatever the heck it is. Mm -hmm. um, and they get into, I don't know, six schools. And they're all kinds of different schools all over the place. And this is where the FOBO sets in, fear of a better option. And I have this happen to me. I got into Georgetown. I remember I got in, and that was my number one choice by a mile. That was the only school I actually really wanted to go to. If you went to Georgetown, you're listening to this, you get, you get me. Of course. But I, but I didn't know, you know, I had no confidence. I, did, I just felt very happy to be in. But then all of a sudden, I got this idea, and I went to my mom, and I said, Mom, I think I should apply to Columbia University. And this, my mom, this is before we had the word FOBO and the lexicon, and my mom said to me, why do you want to apply there? You never wanted to go there. You just want to have another option to choose from. Wow, just, what, yeah, I know. what I an like, insightful like, mother. Mom, yeah. mom, don't be, you're so mean. <laughs> she was right. Um, but I imagine the choice part, you know, there may be, I've seen these scenarios and I had a guest on, um, Cheryl Einhorn, who wrote a book about decision making and she had this whole section of the book about a student who gets a full scholarship at Pitt and then gets into Johns Hopkins but they don't get a scholarship but their family has the, willing, their, the capacity to pay they were, they're pre-med and they're thinking like, which do I do? And they go through this whole decision-making process. How do you, uh, you know, based on you, you lived in this world, like, you know, how, how do you sort of advise people to make these sorts of choices? Yeah, well, the, the most important advice is really to the parents, which is support your child in making their decision. Don't impose your own views on them. I'm gonna bring I this think, back to you in like 10 years. I know, you remind me that I said this. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the biggest challenge is once the acceptance letters come in is that you know everybody wants to know and everybody's asking you where'd you get in and everyone has their own different opinions. And when you're 16, 17 years old, you, you know, it's really hard to tune all of that out and to try to figure out what you want and which school feels right to you when, you know, you're, you're probably also worried about making your parents happy and impressing your friends. Maybe you're going to be swayed. Maybe a, another friend got into a different school that you got into and wants you to go there so you can go together. I mean, there's all of these other pieces of the dynamic, but the most important thing is where what feels right to you. There is such a like fit element to choosing a college and to choosing the place. I mean, you're going to, you not just where you're going to go to school, you're going to live there for the next four years. It's where you're going to form these lifelong friendships. You're going to evolve who you are as a person. Like there's so much more to it than just the pure credentials of the school. So I, I think that 
par the, the parents more than anything can make it more difficult for the child here by trying to push them or steer them to one choice. So you get the parents out of the equation. You have Junior mm -hmm. who visits you know, all five schools. Like what's the key, I mean, thinking more directly about that fit piece, right? Like yeah. what is the student, you know, let's make the kids take responsibility. What do they need to do in their due diligence to really make a smart decision? Well, it's the, the best thing is to go there, right? Not everybody goes and visits these schools. Yeah. So there's, there's nothing better than going there and experiencing it, ideally doing so with, with fellow admitted students, you know, an admitted students weekend, something like that. If not through that, I mean, now there are all of these ways to connect through social media with other admitted students in the same incoming class as yours. So there's a lot, there's a lot of ways to meet other people who are admitted to the school thinking about going. And my, my feeling, and I think when I knew that Georgetown was the right place for me, was when you start meeting the other students you're gonna be with, and you're like, wow, I, like, I, I feel like these are my people. Like, you know, in a, in a high school, or at least in my high school, you know, I, I, I was one of a kind. There was- <laughs> Welcome to my world. <laughs> <laughs> there was no one else that I felt like I, I was, could really truly be myself with. Yes. And then when I was at Georgetown, compared to other schools and visiting friends at other schools, I just felt like there were really a lot of people that I felt I identified with. And I think so that it's, it's hard to explain what it is because I think there's there's this emotional element to choosing the right fit. And I think I, I actually I trust the intuition of the 16, 17 year old. Like what what feels right to you? Yeah, I think that's true. And I, I think also, I mean, people do transfer all the time. It does happen. Yes. So if you make a bad choice, you can always you leave. You can change it. But right. I will say that I had the same experience was when I went to the school, both undergrad and grad school. It's like when I went on that campus and spent you know more than five minutes there, it became very apparent to me almost immediately and talking to people that you know this was the right the right fit yep. how about stepping back okay so you know five years before your kids apply or ten years before your kids mm -hmm. apply do you want to position them to have you've mentioned we talk about stress so I get the yeah. stress because it is overwhelming it's tiring it's long yes. so this is something that it can be multi-year kind of thing mm -hmm. what is what are the elements you should have in place in order to make this experience as frictionless as possible so there are some things that I think are great to start on really early, and then other things that I think you should, you should really leave until okay. junior year and beyond. The junior year and beyond, the biggest one to leave is the test preparation. Don't, so there's no sense in starting your child in SAT test prep in eighth grade. I think that's called child abuse. Right, right. It's not, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not good. So th that, don't, don't start stressing about practicing tests and the score that you're going to get on a test that you're going to take much later. Um, but doing college research from eighth grade, I think is great. I mean, instead of rushing, like the creation of the college list is something that I believe, I mean, I've actually, you, it will not surprise you, I've already started it with my nine-year-old. I'd like to know, we, on, you on, share what's on the list? On Everly Walker Family Vacations, we go on college tours. Um, and, you know, we talk about, we, we look at the students and we talk about, you know, wow. whether she thinks awesome. she can picture herself there. I'm very happy to say that she really likes Vassar, um, mainly because she really likes the library. It is one of the most beautiful college libraries. Um, but it's, it, like it's, it. so, it's so close to New York City that, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that she's Yeah, and, and, that. And, and one of the stats that was in the report that I would mention in, in the intro is that, like, Something like 30% of kids value the fact that a school is close to home when choosing it, whereas like 75% yes. of parents do. Isn't that funny? It's like, yeah. Yeah, it's like opposite and like yeah. mile radius. Exactly. Yeah. I was like, no, I'm going to get out of here, you know? Yeah, I'm going to go far. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, you know, you can, you can start thinking about what these schools are like, what, you know, going to visit them, looking at what's different between them, what might fit you, what do you think you want to study. The, those elements of it, I think people often wait too long to start thinking about or talking about with their kids. I, I'm surprised how often I meet parents of high school juniors or seniors who, you know, are like, oh, what's your advice for the college process? And they'll say, well, you know, tell, tell me about your son. What's, what's he interested in? Where does he want to go? And, the, you know, they're, they're like, oh, he wouldn't even know what he wants. And it's like, well, you know, he probably could with, with some, more, some more time spent talking about it. Yeah, and I think, you know, your point is, a, is brings up this idea that if you expose your kids to schools and just give them the experience of seeing what a college campus looks like, yeah. it's probably interesting to them. So like, you know, some kids really like sports, some kids really like music and all these mm -hmm. sorts of things. 
And some kids really maybe get interested in colleges and maybe they want to go to summer camp at a college and just yep. start exposing themselves to the kinds of opportunities they will have yep. so that when they get into the process, you know, they're, they're um, they, it's not as, as de it's demystified a little bit for yeah, them. Yeah, they know, they know what it's like. And that's a really good point. There's so many ways to get on a college campus before college now. There are a lot of camps. There's a lot of classes you can take. There's a lot of ways to get exposed to the college way of life. And yeah. what, what about the on the application, the, the essay? Like, do you have any, you know, I'm sure par you have parents all the time who write the essays for the kid. I've heard these stories, you know, you read this, yeah. this kid is using sort of like very fancy vocabulary that a kid wouldn't use, or maybe the parent, I don't even know, refers to themselves or something like that. People yeah. make these mistakes. Yeah. What is the key to writing a great essay for a, a college junior, senior? The key is, it's, it's, it's the same key for a college essay as writing any great piece, any great article, any great book. It's about telling a story, a compelling and personal story. And, you know, everyone has them. Every, you know, it can be about the most minute thing or about a grand thing that happened in your life, but telling something really personal that shows who you are is what catches the attention of admissions advisors. You know, there, there was this article a few months ago about how, um, the, uh, an admissions advisor said that she one of their questions was, who do you admire most? And she's like, these days, if I see the words Hermione Granger, I just stop reading and put it aside. She's like, you wouldn't believe how many applicants to college say that they admire Hermione. And she's like, it's just, it's not, it's not unique. Wow. That was going to be my Halloween costume. I guess I'm going to have to change it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um... <laughs> Um, Go Ron Weasley. Nobody, nobody yeah, says Ron. Yeah, that's good. I can get a, a, little, a little orange wig. Yeah. Um, and final, <laughs> final, final question. Rejection. Mm -hmm. So the kid applies. Their dream is to go to whatever school, Vassar, Georgetown, University of Wisconsin. Yes. They're rejected. Yeah. As the parent, how do you help them through that? So this is a big deal because especially these days, that it, this might be the, the first real, real moment of clear acceptance rejection that this child has experienced, right? There's a lot less yes. grading. There's a lot less winning and losing yes. um, in childhood today through high school. And so it's, it's really hard. I mean, it never gets easy to want something and, you know, click and open a screen that says, sorry, we don't want you. So I think that, you know, it's important to talk about it, prepare for it before the letter comes one way or another. And the best way to do that is to have, you know, multiple options that are appealing where you know you'll be happy. Don't get too hung up on that one score. You gotta have that plan B. Yeah, because what if, um, you know, just what, what if there's one school and the, par you know, the parents love it and they're buying sweatshirts and hanging pendants on the walls and the student, you know, if everybody feels all in on this one school and if the student feels that from their parents, yeah. then they're going to feel this double. Not only will they feel rejected, but they'll feel like they're disappointing others. So That gives me stress. I get stressful. it. I'm feeling I'm having the stress it's moment. It's really stressful. All right. Kate Everly Walker is, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know if we, we didn't talk about this before, but is there, if people want to follow you, in social media, what's the best place to uh, to go? I would say for if you if you want to know my views on education, follow me on Twitter at Eberly Walker. If you want to see adorable pictures of my daughters, follow me on Instagram at Eberly Walker. There we go, amazing. <laughs> okay, thanks so much, Kate Eberly Walker. Thanks, Patrick. So, uh, to lighten the mood a bit, uh, in one way or another, um, but it's kind of heavy in its own way. I wanted to give you my faux moment of the week. This is the moment where I talk about something that either provoke FOMO in me or just kind of talked about FOMO in the global news cycle. And for me, the FOMO, FOMO of the week was the debut of Serial. If you know the podcast Serial, I don't like to necessarily promote everybody else's podcast, but Serial is kind of special. The first season was an incredible story of a murder mystery that uh, was, 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 was really uh, became part of the national conversation. Second series, to be honest, didn't have a lot of FOMO, kind of skipped it. But the third series is so good, if you haven't heard it yet, didn't know it was out, go and download it, Serial. And with that, uh, I'd like to wrap up. Uh, as always, you can find out more about me, more about FOMO Sapiens, more about part-time entrepreneurship or 10% entrepreneurship at my website, patrickmcginnis.com, where you will find links to my social, to lots of good information, and where you can even find a way to email me at letsconnect.patrickmcginnis.com to submit your own FOMO moment of the week. So please 
check out my website on iTunes, leave me a review, maybe five stars, and until next time, take care of yourself.